Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Logistics Executive TV. Um, and thank you for joining us for a leadership series podcast today. I'm joined by uh, some very special guests from different parts of the world. Um, but I'm also joined by my co-host, uh, Cassandra Lee, our Global Managing Partner for Search at Logistics Executive Group, uh, all the way from Brisbane. Cassandra Lee. Hey, Cass. Hi, Kim. Nice to be joining you today. Thanks so much for t- uh, coming on board. And uh, also joined in Brisbane as well uh, by Simon Popley. Simon is the founder and CEO of Coaching Leadership, and uh, he is an executive developmental leadership coach, um, runs a significant practice in Australia. He's into C-suite executive uh, development, team coaching, and coaching supervision. Simon, thanks for joining us. Uh, good to be here, Kim. Thanks for having me on the show. Cheers. And also joined uh, in Dubai today by Mark Colbin, MBE. Mark is a Paralympic uh, gold medalist. He's an international TEDx speaker and leadership and results coach and mentor. Mark, thanks for joining us. Hi, Kim. My pleasure. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Great to see you all. So today, folks, we're going to be talking uh, about coaching with uh, two very different coaches from different ecosystems, different backgrounds, and working in totally different uh, work environments. So Cassandra and I are going to explore a little bit about um, some of the snapshots, uh, environmental activities that are going on in the world of these two coaches, uh, some of the thoughts that they can share with us, uh, some of the lessons, and uh, the, the ways that they operate to support their clients with coaching and mentoring uh, in their daily activities. So uh, I thought we might start today with a little bit of background, Mark, with yourself as to uh, how the coaching will develop for you. Um, You've come from um, a a sporting background, um, but prior to to that, um, life was slightly different. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, very much so. Um, born and bred in South Wales in the United Kingdom, and uh, just went through the you know the schooling system. But the uh, the one passion I had was sport. You know, I had a big a big passion for sport, health, and well being, and that led me into I guess the sports of triathlon. I was a keen rock climber, and I guess one of my dreams was to become a paragliding pilot. I just wanted that Peter Pan moment, you know, as most children actually, you know, want. And in 2008, I qualified as a paragliding pilot. And unfortunately, literally within eight months um, of actually being a pilot, I was flying above South Wales, above the Gower Peninsula, a beautiful, tranquil um, part of South Wales. And unfortunately, my canopy collapsed just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I basically fell from around 40 feet onto grass. Uh, Thankfully, I landed on my feet, um, not my bottom, because if I'd landed on my bottom, the pressure would have gone up through my spine and probably killed me instantly. But that afternoon, um, I actually broke my back. I broke T12, ended up with a huge thoracic fracture. So that meant, you know, a long time in hospital after having a, a spinal operation. So they say that life begins at 40, and it certainly did for me. You know, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and I, you know, I've heard you um, speak uh, in TEDx uh, speeches about some of that experience, and uh, we'll we'll drill down on and how that led you into the world of coaching uh, as we move through today. Um, Simon, um, you uh, you come from um, a corporate background. Uh, you've got a very extensive um business background working and a lot of uh financial institutions as i understand it yeah uh, mainly um uh, commercial insurance with a specific focus on actually on personal injury uh, so I, I worked in the occupational uh, occupational rehabilitation industry for quite a period of time managing workers with um, injured workers uh, managing workers with uh, physical and psychological injuries case management of those and then later on into commercial commercial insurance and then into, into consulting. Um, but always with a focus on um, coaching and developing leadership. So you know, as, as, a, as a small teenager, I could always be found with something 
Jung or Freud or something trying to, yeah, this fascination about understanding human behavior. So that sort of that, that sort of segued into leadership and then into coaching later on in life. So Mark, now thanks thanks for sharing that, Simon. And and back to you, Mark, on terms of uh your development into uh a coaching career that you are now involved in. Um Talk to us a little bit about how you ended up getting into the sporting world from, uh, from uh, you're, you're a, a gold medalist, uh, Paralympic cyclist. How did coaching start to impact on your world from that point onwards? Yes, it started, uh, I'll never forget, it was June 2010 when I made the decision to commit 100% to London 2012 for two reasons. One, I knew that London was going to happen with or without me and I wanted to be part of the Paralympics. And just to be part of it, that was the whole dream from day one. And working with a cycling coach in South Wales, a wonderful gentleman called Neil Smith. And Neil, I guess, had belief in me, you know, as a, as a coachee at the time, um, certainly demonstrating what I would regard as ethical practices. Because remember, you know, I was, I was, I was literally 12 months post operative. So, so Neil, I guess had that um, incredible coaching mindset to give me the self belief and self confidence that maybe, just maybe, I could be successful at the home games. So I'm very grateful, you know, for Neil, um, you know, for for his efforts to coach me, um, to take me from almost, I suppose, just being a, a normal guy who's just broke his back, you know, to introduce me into the realms of British cycling you know, into the world of the elite and, and and knew that I had something special to offer, but didn't really know exactly what I was capable of of achieving. And then moving into, you know, the world of British cycling, as I said, um, 18 months before the Paralympics, it was a whole new world of wonderful experiences and knowledge, you know, for me being somebody that uh, as, I guess has, has always been coachable. And I was open to being coached, you know, by, you know, by some of the best coaches in sport in the world. So it was a great insight um, for me, uh, and that, that that just gave me even more confidence, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And Simon, what about you? How did how did you get into coaching? Um, developing other leaders, developing other leaders. So I was, it's like I, I thought, I sort of reflected, well, why why have I been successful in business? Like, why have the teams I I've, I've led why they've been successful, and not because of me, but because I develop leaders within those teams or the leaders leading those teams. So that's that's yeah, that's that was the that was the spark that went. Well, this is, uh, yeah. and I, it, it just seems to be anything I was actually any good at either. <laughs> so <laughs> it just seems to be a natural fit for the things that I was I was interested in. Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on on the word that Mark said about the belief part. The belief part of a coach is we know from the research, so it doesn't matter whether a coach has a cognitive behavioral approach or a psychodynamic or dynamic approach, but the research tells us that 40% of the success of the outcome is dependent on that belief from that coach. It's such an incredible, it's such a powerful motivator to move you forward, having someone believing you. It's just, well, talking, we've got marks achieved. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and equally, you know, the that. trust that trust that you have between the two of you, you know, it needs to be so inherent and, and the chemistry, like any critical relationship. You know, like Mark, you had mentioned sort of earlier in, in some of your previous um TED talks about the power of trust. So, you know, we see that how critical it is in a sporting context. But when we start to move that into co- the corporate world, do you see, you know, the the depth of that trust? you know, overlaying and, and being in parallel or is it, you know, is it something unique about the sporting world that makes it inherently stronger to have that level of trust that, you, you know, that you had in your coaches or, or how do you get to to convey that into a corporate environment and, and then be able to use that with teams? Yeah, very much so. I think the, the world of sport um, is slowly but surely, you know, segueing its, in, it's, segueing its, its ethos into business. Um, because of the old saying, you know, you have to be world class in the boardroom. If you want to promote peak performance, you know, it starts with you. 
And I think some, you know, there's definitely something that I learned um, from a coaching perspective is the coach listening, you know, actively listening to what you're relaying back, um, maintaining presence within the environment, you know, of uh, of the athlete. And and certainly from my experience here in Dubai, you know, that's that's now being seen more and more in almost every corporate environment that I present and coach in um, is that the environment has to, you know, cultivate trust and safety from a coach and a, a coachee's perspective, you know, which is a good thing, you know, which is a good thing. And Simon, I know you, you've had a, a study um, that you shared recently where we were talking about the, the quantity or the investment that is actually made in coaching teams and how at certain senior levels it's, you know, it's X value and then at uh, more sort of mid-management levels it's Y value. Do you see that, you know, with coaching from a sporting context, you know, we, we put in a lot of money even through junior developments. Where are we going wrong when it comes to our corporate leadership teams that we're only putting it at more senior levels where we've got so much development that should really be happening at our mid-management levels? Or are you starting to see a bit of a change in that? Or is it in certain markets? Or, you know, what are you seeing from a, a corporate perspective currently? That's a great question. Cassandra, from a corporate perspective, we need really, we leadership development is upside down and we sort of, you need to redress some of that balance. There's a, um, the federal government can, um, asked uh, Melbourne University to do a larger study ever of Australian uh, leadership, it's a 2016 study, and it showed that for every $10 we spend at the executive level, we only spend $1 on first line leadership. So if we think about it, if you have like a hot day in your garden, you've got 10 gallons, you've got you know, got, got 10 litres of water. At the moment, we take all that water and we give it to the oak trees. Yeah. The seedlings in the garden, well, they, they might get a little online package or a few drops. Yeah, so it's seen coaching, executive coaching and leadership coaching in lots of ways is seen as a reward when you get to the top, not mm-hmm. a means to help you get there and develop, and develop a, a pipeline of talent. So we've got this sort of huge issue there, you know, in a sporting context where, you know, we put a lot of funds into developing the talent to then be able to foster as many as we possibly can to then get that unique one to get across the line. Whereas in a corporate sector, inverted, as you yeah. say, where we're only doing it on the one who's already excelled as opposed to, you know, funneling a lot more through our organisations or through our areas. So, gents, in that context, like if we were to look at an individual, so, you know, from my side of it at, at Logistics Executive, we're dealing with, a lot of senior candidates who are, you know, taking accountability for their own careers. Some of them have executive coaching support through their organisations, and it's very much it depends on the headquarter of the organisation and the culture of that firm. In some continents, it's a very strong um, focus and, and certainly embedded into learning and develop leadership um, development for their teams. In other continents, it's like unheard of, and you'll find people wanting to do it on their own and and take accountability, um, you know, for their own career development. So when it comes to individuals corporately wanting to get a coach, what are some of the things that they need to be looking for in their executive coach? Mark, do you want to share sort of some of the key things that you think a coach should have for an individual? And and Simon will get your thoughts as well. Yeah, very much so. It's a a, a great point, actually. Um, It's the old saying, you know, no, no successful team or person has ever been successful without a coach. And from my experience working, you know, within the world class program, you know, at British Cycling, um, some of the coaches weren't very strong when they were cycling. Okay. Yeah. They weren't. And we used to have a giggle, you know, as, as a disabled athlete to yeah. actually beat, to actually beat your coach who was able bodied. We, we had a giggle, you know, but, but my point then is, is that that person, could actually instruct me and coach me and support me on how to become a better cyclist. Okay. How to become even stronger with the work off the bike, which would then help us on the bike. So, so in my experience, you know, that person may not be great at doing that one subject, but they are amazing at coaching you to be the best you can be. And it goes, yes. it goes much deeper than certainly with exec coaching and certainly the C-suite coaching that, you know, obviously Simon is partaking in is, is you may not be the best in that subject, but if you can get the best out of somebody in that subject, 
then obviously your job is done. That's a, that's, that's a good point. And, and Simon, I wanted to throw to you um, just on the issue of, uh, and as a disclaimer, you and I both met when we were uh, qualifying or getting our qualifications and executive coaching must be virtually a decade ago. Um, and uh, since then, of course, uh, you, you've developed the practice there and we've, we've developed the practice in, uh, around the world with logistics executive. Um, I, I had the opportunity to work with you um, and uh, bring you into a, a fairly significant contract that we had in Sydney several years ago. And uh, this was uh, a dynamic team environment where there was a lot of um, a lot of politicking going on. So the the briefing on the coaching for development of a, of a team was pretty straightforward. But as we got into it, and you were the lead very much on it, as I was the host, um, you, you took over on a number of the days, uh, just working with those dynamics of people with different agendas. Well, how in team coaching, how do you get to the core of of getting the results that the client wants in terms of elevating everybody in amongst you've got all this different variety of, of people with different agendas. What's what's the rule of thumb for you as to how to approach that? I think it's so I think it's always the role of the coach to take the client or clients where the clients want to go. And I think in going to that particular example, what seemed like a simple, simple, a simple task at the moment, well, at the beginning, of course, it, 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 it usually never is. Um, it's to take, it's to be able to deliver for the organisation and for that and for that particular team. So I think understanding the dynamics of the team. I think in the perfect situation, you undertake you undertake some discovery using some some evidence-based, valid and reliable psychometrics. So you've got some baseline data or you might perhaps you might undertake, you might undertake um, structured interviews and theme those responses. But then having a clear, I think the key, the key also is having um, clear senior support and belief in, in, in and support actually looking where, where, where does that team want to go? What is it they want to achieve? And actually having that support within the organisation, because without that support, it doesn't matter what coaching or mentoring you apply, it's not it's not going to be successful. And and then also along that journey, building building the intervention around real work problems, so that it's not some theoretical, it's not some theoretical like team bonding exercise. What they're doing, what's being done, is being embedded in the way that that team works together during the day. Okay, awesome. And Mark, in, in your case, um, I know you you run a, a lot of team coaching here. You do it around the the uh, the environment of uh, I don't know how many kilometres you do a week, but uh, certainly some days when I speak to you, you've just done a couple of hundred, and you've gone coast to coast from one coast from here to the other, about three hundred kilometres the other day, and you're you're running teams from that. But then you're you're also specialising in breaking down into individual coaching from those teams. Um, you know how how has that evolved in your practice, and and how are you finding where the the requirements and the demands are coming from from your clients? Yeah, I think there's a there's a hell of a lot of uh, companies, you know, here different industries who are looking for something different in team building. And, you know, I use cycling, you know, as the foundation, um, even as a, you know, even as a, a disabled cyclist, you know, you are quite right. You know, I can still out, still bang out the kilometers, uh, when I need to. Um, but using, you know, cycling as the foundation, you know, it's amazing for mental health. You know, it helps, you know, all, I suppose, all shapes and sizes, shall I say, to, you know, enjoy that feeling of being on the bike. It's low impact. So there's no damage to the bones. There's no damage to your physiology and, and certainly putting riders into what they call what is known as super compensation, where your body's, your body's, your body's actually doing the exercise, but you're not thinking, you know, it's like, like when you drive, most people mm. don't think when they drive, maybe some people should, but, <laughs> but at the same time, it's, it's relaxing the body and the brain, which helps so much, you know, with mental health. And that's something that we're definitely promoting here, you know, with our team building days, 
um, taking people who maybe have never cycled before. So you're teaching them skills, coordination skills, fitness skills, health and well-being skills, and certainly, you know, communication skills, you know, with their, you know, with their peers um, as well. So, so yeah, at the moment, it's, um, it's a brand new venture. And uh, and it's been successful already, and we're literally only three months in now. So uh, so yeah, it's going really well. Very good. So Simon, quick question for you, uh, and Cass also possibly yourself, because you do a lot of coaching as part of your um, engagement with with clients and in particular senior candidates. So maybe I'll start with you, Cass. Uh, in terms of you know when we see. Um, you know, challenges in, in the economy or the environment, the business environment, because we've got a very strange uh, environment currently in many parts of the world where we've still got a very strong talent shortage, but, um, you, you know, economic signals aren't that strong, but uh, and a lot of companies are challenged, but there's, unlike other economic uh, cycles, there, there isn't a, a high uh, unemployment. There's low unemployment. So there's a lot of challenges around getting the best from executives in a business. And when companies turn to coaching to support um, the capabilities uh, of their executives inside of a business, do you, do you find during times like this that um, uh, companies are looking to to get different uh, elements of capability out of coaches at times like this and then uh, more robust times or is it pretty much the same? Yeah, I think there's definitely more impetus for them to get a higher yield out of what they're doing right now. You know, everything becomes uh, a lot more acute and and the outcomes are you know, absolutely critical. So given that you just can't sort of change out a person and then go through all the transformation that that requires and the time that it takes in the investment, there definitely is that focus on having coaches who can understand the context of the industry that the business is actually in, how they're operating, what their competitive environments actually are. So having that sort of familiarity where there's parallels and, and they can have that comprehension as to, you know, what the pressure cooker actually is that the, that the executive is in becomes more critical than other. And then even for candidates, if they're doing it on their own, having that relatability with a coach that actually understands that context is, is critical right now versus boom periods where it, it's not as much of an issue um, because we're not, you know, we're, we're not trying to extract the same level of yield then as what we are right now. So that context is definitely changed as the economic cycle becomes tighter from a candidate and a corporate um, perspective. And then the actual structured program on really working with that executive and the greater leadership team to get them to be in sync and have that harmony as opposed to making it one person's problem or one executive's problem, really trying to understand the, the entire ELT of how to get them to be a lot more collaborative and even boards, getting boards to have the right skills and the right composition to leverage all of those skills that are there. So that then puts a lot of pressure on the actual coach who needs to address this at multiple different layers in an economic environment such as what we're seeing now. Okay. Well, thanks, Cass. Um, Simon, throw to you. Uh, are you see, are you seeing any particular trends more common than others in regards to the requirements where you're engaged by the corporate? Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a three party uh, arrangement and agreement between the coachee, the coach, and the corporate as the sponsor is often the case. Um, are you seeing any sort of dominant trends in the moment in terms of the the emphasis that that you are being called to work with on a particular uh, and candidates in particular? Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, obviously, we're seeing less. Just from, from a referral perspective, we're seeing less senior less senior leaders who would normally be coached because of this job market, because of the the the, the, the tightness of the job, the shortage in the, in the labour market of people being referred for development rather than going down, well, this person's now going to be performance managed and isn't doing the job, we're going to look at someone new. It's now, well, we need to work with the clay we have and mm -hmm. develop that person rather than, so I think there is, I think, which is good. 
which I think yeah. is which is positive. It's like, well, let's, you know, we've made a commitment to this person. As soon as it's not right, before it was like throw the baby out with the bathwater. And now we're just like, you know, let's change the bath drawer a little bit, you know. So and yeah, and the the uh, the clients we've worked in, we've, you know, they're not they're not normally major, they're not normally major issues. They're normally small developmental shifts that person needs to make and the, the, the relationships aligned and back on track. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think it's good. I think it's a positive thing. Sure. Yeah. sure then. So Mark, uh, from from your perspective, uh, you you dealt with uh, a, a lot of over the last ten years or so. You've dealt with a lot of different organisations, um, a lot of industries, and uh, and done a lot of mentoring as well in in those organisations. Uh, what are, you, what are you finding uh, some of the, the key trends that, that organisations are really looking for when they engage somebody like you to, to help develop their, their talent inside of an organisation? Is there a couple of key areas that you find that, that you're drawing on more than others? Yeah, very much so. I think um, what's common in the workplace now certainly is people don't want to be managed anymore. You know, people want to be coached. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they want they want support from, you know, from a coach who can help them to get to where they want to be. You know, most mm-hmm. of the time, you know, the coachee would actually have their own answers. It's a case of asking the right questions at the right time to bring out the answers, you know, mm-hmm. to to push them through perturbation, you know, where they get that ha ha moment. Um, and certainly from my experience, the last few years, you know, introducing what I've learned on the world class cycling program and how to facilitate client growth you know as a human being and then moving outwards into a team and then finally even into a, a whole organization you know how do you work on people's strengths you know and build on those strengths um to as i said you know facilitate client growth so so yeah that's definitely something that i'm working towards is helping people to become the best they can be you know, right. most definitely, and uh, and and not to inspire people, but to actually coach people how to inspire themselves. You know, it's the old analogy: teach a man to fish, isn't it? You know. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something I've been working towards. Excellent. Hey, Mike, I just wanted to throw something at you uh, because you know we, we we talked a lot about senior executives, and I think a lot of people have this idea. That coaching is for what we've talked a little bit about mid mid uh, level coaching uh, in terms of uh, career level, um, but in your your world, if we talk about the latest generation Z Z generation and uh, newer people in the workforce, uh, how do you go about dealing? I mean, one are you uh, dealing with younger and uh, newer generation? Uh, folks that you're working with on coaching and if so you know what's the is there different rules and, and ways of going about being effective with your coaching practice for, for the, these newer generations or is it all pretty much the same well I think in my opinion you know it comes back to us all being human but all having different values you know as a 53 year old man my values are going to be slightly different to a 23 year old person you know mm-hmm. but 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 my question to that person would be, you know, what's your why? You know, obviously using the Simon Sinek theory, you know, um, you know, you're going to create a legacy. You're you're young enough now to have the time to create that legacy. You know, what 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 do you want to leave behind? Because the the true facts, and I've shared this with you off camera. You know, the words of my late father was, you know, many many years ago that one day in the future, tomorrow will be your last day. You so, you know, it's so important. It's so important to create that legacy. And if you can yeah. plan that legacy, then obviously, you know, even better. But uh, it's it's a tough call for the youngsters coming through, you know, the, the young management right now. Um, but they still have to bring with them true human values, yeah. you know, which are worth their weight in gold. Simon, uh, different strokes for different folks, different generations or same principles? No, I think all the research, all, all the research that looks at you know are different generations different, and they want to be treated differently. It's 
is no. The whole thing is 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 a is a nonsense. That the human brain has for the last thirty thousand years, the structure of the brain has been, you know, uh, has has been the same. And as as Mark said, we might be we might be you know further along that road and have a different perspective to somebody here. There's a difference in values and perspective. I think if we look at what what we've, the basic human needs, they have not changed. We all want to we want to have agency. We want to be seen as we want to be seen as competent and having mastery in something. And we all want to. We want to be appreciated, and we want to form. We we want to put we form uh, positive relationships with other with other humans. And that's it doesn't matter how old you are or where you come from. Though that though those um, uh, factors of intrinsic human motivation are exactly the same and have not changed. Good. So I think as long as we're as long as we're coaching to those frameworks, we're able to create a connection with with, with our clients. Hey, well, folks, look, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been a great snapshot, getting an insight into the worlds that you're operating in, the way that you're applying coaching techniques and some of the uh, the examples that you've, you've provided with us. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to um, do what we normally do with our, our guests and get one tip. So if somebody was looking to engage a coach, what would be the one tip? Simon, from you, what, would, what should they look at? Just briefly. Yeah. If you're looking at a leadership coach, the research tells us that coaches with a psychological training get better outcomes. So I would say look at a coach that has a solid psychological training. Okay. Matt, thoughts from you? Yes, I think a, a coach that has your interests at heart, not theirs. Yeah, okay. And Cass, we've we've done research recently on LinkedIn with a poll. And one of the key drivers when people are saying to us when they are uh, looking to engage somebody, they mainly want to know uh, the primary thing is industry-specific experience to the background. Uh, any Absolutely. final thought from you and uh, when what people should be looking at to engage your coach? Yeah, I think the context of your coach's experience is absolutely critical. So get somebody who's got that alignment for your specific outcomes, you know, whatever they might be, whether it's executive internal coaching, sporting world, whatever it may be, get that context alignment. I think that's absolutely critical. And then chemistry. Great. Well, thanks again, uh, Simon, Mark, Cassandra. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody uh, in the audience for, for joining us today. I uh, really enjoyed today's conversation. I'm sure we're going to be following up with others. And uh, everybody, have a great day.